Romans chapter 5, let's read. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I'm going to read some more now. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there, was no, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more. The grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came through one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The title of my message today is Jesus Christ our Lord. And over in Romans chapter 14, verse 9, it says, For to this end Christ died and rose again and lived again, that he might be Lord, that he might be Lord. When we think of Christ's lordship, we, we think that he's in control, and that's true. In the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus you have to know that those Jewish followers of him were thrown for quite a loop. They thought that he was going to be the Messiah who restored Israel to prominence. Instead, he was brutally murdered on a cross. Could you imagine seeing this with your eyes, being one of his followers? All the promises of the Messianic kingdom being thrown to the ground. Everything you had been taught about the Messiah in stark contrast to what you see with your eyes. And yet, on the third day, he appears in their midst. And how many of you know that must have been scary? And the Bible's very, it downplays everything. Because if somebody appeared in my midst, I would freak out. And he says, have you anything? He says, peace to you. And he says, you got something to eat? I'm hungry. And he eats in their midst. And I just love the comedy of Scripture. 
because God's on his plan and his agenda and everybody else is kind of tripping out as he does his thing. And then he opens the scriptures to them and says, this is what had to happen. The Messiah had to die. It's all throughout the Old Testament, the suffering servant. And he showed them the scriptures. I think it's very important that we walk by faith and not by sight. Because life can throw you curveballs. I know for my life, I have so many ups and downs just in one day. Last week, we had a, uh, somebody in the church that, that died right before I got up to preach. Then I was in the ER after I preached two times with my mother-in-law, who's here today. Hi, Mom. And she fell and broke her wrist. And then we had two emergencies in the church uh, with stuff going on in families after that. And at the end of my Sunday, as good as service was and as much victory as I saw we had, and we had two ladies that came to Christ that morning, at the end of the day, I said, please, God, let this day end. <laughs> uh, have you ever prayed that prayer, please, God, let this day end? I was, I was grateful, but I just needed a nap for a long time. Amen. And, every, and I just woke up, and that's what happened that day. How many of you ever just wake up, and, th and then you just all... And Lori and I were sitting on our porch the other day, enjoying the day, and we started reflecting just over the last year we've had in the church. And then we reflected over the last 10 years. Next month will be our 10-year anniversary as a church. And just all the good and the crazy and the far out, and then we reflected on the last 20 years, on the last 30 years, on the last 40 years. How many of you know it's been a wild ride? How many of you believe that your life has been far out? Besides me, anybody? But the message, one of the great messages of the cross and of Easter is that God is not subject to circumstance. Circumstance and scenario is subject to God. If God is subject to circumstance, then you should walk by sight and not by faith. The reason we read the Bible is to get a divine perspective on our life so that no matter what's going on, we are on a clear trajectory. Our feet are set on a course that has nothing to do with what anybody else is doing but our relationship with God. Does that make sense to you? And I think that's what Jesus is saying. You guys need to read your Bible more. That's what he said to them. Look in the scriptures. This is what was supposed to happen. And when we start to read the word and hear the voice of God, boy, life becomes a lot easier to deal with than the ups and downs of life, everything going on. I thought I'd be real spiritual if I became a pastor. But I tell you, if I use these peepers all day long, they need to put me in a straitjacket. With all of the emotion and the stuff, it is the Judge Roy scream. Is that what they call it? The Judge Roy scream? Yes. All the time. It's the shockwave. It's all the rides I ever rode in my adolescence packaged into church. Just with everything, highs and lows, joys and sorrows, all wrapped up into one day. And if we don't hear the voice of God and we don't get his divine perspective on things, very important that we do. And so I wanted to go through Romans 5 this morning just for a few minutes and tell you about the package deal that we have in our relationship with Christ. The reason, the connecting points of our relationship to Christ and our salvation, what we are to trust him for in our salvation. Paul's going to say, hey, listen, we're justified by faith. We have peace with God. And when you go through hard stuff, it's all working together for the good. You're going to grow in your character, in your perseverance, and in your hope. So don't get freaked out about your circumstances because God's working it all together. Isn't that wonderful? And then he's going to give some reasons. And I want to give these connecting points to you today so that we can all praise God for who he is, for what Christ did, and for the ultimate understanding. God's in control, you guys. How many of you believe that today? How many of you thankful for that? How many of you thankful knuckleheads aren't? Amen. All right. Very good. So let's go through this today. 
And uh, Paul says, we've been justified. We're going through tribulation. That means trouble happens. But it produces perseverance, character, hope. And it, this hope does not disappoint. Hope is future tense. It doesn't disappoint because of what God has done in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, well, let me say this. These five connecting points are connected to the words much more. Much more than circumstance, much more than whatever you're going through, much more. How many of you are thankful for the much more? It says it five times in this passage. And as I was praying over what I should preach today, Jesus just put it in my heart, tell them about the much more they get in me. So here we go. First much more, first connecting point that we have in our relationship with God is the love of God. It says, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It says, for scarcely for a righteous man one would die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more being justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Paul pits the love of God against our weakness, our failures, our sins. He says... One of the great connecting points for a Christian to Christ is not that the Christian got his act straight, is not that the Christian promised to be stronger, but it was at the point of weakness. It was while we were in sin. That's when God demonstrated his love for us by giving his son to die for our sin. This is where love is between God and you. God loves you just the way you are. And in spite of the way you are. And he made you the way you are. How many of you know none of us are good enough for God? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're not ever going to be good enough. Some people think they are. They're terribly mistaken. But God said, I set it up this way so that I would love you in an unconditional kind of sense. In a sense that right where you are, that's why. That's when I demonstrated my love for you. How many of you in your life, how many of you woke up one morning after you beat yourself up all night with sin? I used to have bad dreams that my Doppler ganger would come after me. I know it's early on Easter morning. You came into the, a different church. All right, very good. I would be wrestling. I'd turn a corner, and there I am grinning at me, and we'd go to town wrestling. I'd wake up, and i realize I'm my own worst problem, you know? Um, I remember times in my adolescence after I had messed up so bad the night before, and I'd wake up, and i say, there's no way God... I don't even know if I'm a Christian the way I've behaved. And yet, strange comfort would find me. Unnatural, because I wanted to throw myself away. And also, God would send people that loved me when I didn't love myself. It was at the point of my weakness that God found me. How many of you ever had somebody love you when you didn't love yourself? How many of you had somebody who wouldn't let you go when you were in bad shape. It's one of my connecting points with God. Is not that he loved me, it was when he loved me. How many of you thankful for much more love than your sin? How many of you thankful for that today? Isn't that a, a connecting point? I don't know all the mysteries of God, but I know that is, in my experience, very true. He poured his love in my heart. Why is that important? He says here, so that, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. He says, we shall be saved from his wrath. He says, if God did that for you in the past, that gives you confidence 
your, your future is going to be okay. Number one, he loved us, and he took a weak, good-for-nothing, sorry, ungodly, sinner, and I might say professional. How many of you know some of you know that you do sin in real good? Like you've been well-practiced. You are a sinner, as in to do it all the time. And it says, Romans eight thirty seven. yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's his love that causes us to have victory in our lives. It's almost like a subduing love. It's like a love that happened to us and gives us the courage to conquer even when we buy. How many of you are thankful that you're not defined by your fatal flaws? You're not defined by your fatal weaknesses. How many of you know everybody's got one? You can point to your strength, but it's that Achilles heel business in your life that you know is prophesying over your future. No more, because the much more of his love is prophesying over your life. Secondly, here comes the second much more. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through the, our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We used to be his enemies. How many of you ever struggled with anger? How many of you have been angry, angry at God for putting you in that family, for allowing things to happen to you that he could have saved you from? All kinds of, how many of you have ever been mad? How many of you still struggle with anger ever, ever so often? How many of you struggle not to be angry, but when you're on the other side of anger, you like it? I don't even know what we're fighting about. Let's just do this thing. You don't need a bad re or good reason. All right. But it says he not only loved us, but when we were his enemies, he reconciled us to God. In his body, he... The Bible says he broke the enmity between us and God in his body on the cross. That we have received the reconciliation. What does that mean? It means God put a friend request on Facebook to you, and when you accept it, you're friends. That's a terrible example. All right. <laughs> it means uh, to receive the reconciliation means that you didn't pull your weight to make sure this thing was going to go right. It means the whole deal of reconciliation was in Christ. And you received it by faith. It means that God, through Christ, is now your friend even when you're angry. Even when you're not a good friend to him, the much more reconciliation is a good friend to you. Maybe thankful God's much more a friend to you than you are to him. Even when you were his enemy, the reconciliation happened on the cross, and you've received it by faith. You've received the reconciliation. If God be for you, who can be against you? He who did not spare his only son, how much more shall he give you everything you need? Another connecting point in our salvation is not only the love of God, it's his friendship to us. The Bible says that Noah walked with God. How many of you know Noah was lonely? There was nobody else who walked with God but Noah. The whole wide world was against him. But he walked with God. And how many of you know you just need one good friend? How many of you know in life you just need one good friend? How many of you know at times in your past it's come down to one good friend? I tell you, I'm married to my best friend, Lori Lee. At one point in my life, she was my one good friend. But in Christ, you don't need a lot of people. You've got one good friend, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He will friend the anger out of you. I'm angry, John. I don't understand why all this has happened to me. 
family, the much more friend is going to. So he doesn't force you to love him. He doesn't force you in the sense of make you. He woos you. He won't stop coming after you. He is so sweet and he won't stop and it's just like a tidal wave of much more until you're swallowed up in it. That's how it happens, but it happens. It's not this domineering, I'm making you do things. It's this, I'm not going to stop. You're going to get tired of me until you scream, Abba, when I twist your arm enough in a wooing kind of wonderful. <laughs> Why did you persecute me, Saul? Blind your eyes. Amen. <laughs> but it's much more nonetheless. This reconciliation between us and God happened in God. And then it happens to us. How many of you are thankful for the friendship you have in God? How many of you are thankful that he wouldn't stop with you even when you were angry? Yeah, I forget all that I'm going to say. Jesus Christ our Lord is the last words of this chapter. Why is he Lord? He's Lord of everything out there, but he's Lord over our lives because of the things he's overcome. He overcame our weakness with his love. He overcame our anger with his friendship. In the Old Testament, when they said, Lord, it was Jehovah, they would, they would put a covenantal name next to Lord. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd. He is to the Christian Lord because of the things he has overcome on our behalf. He went through all of that that he might be Lord so he could demonstrate his power on our behalf, Lord. So that when I receive him as Lord, it's not just so that I can do right and fly right. It's because I need him to overcome and subdue my Achilles heel, my weakness with his love, my anger and enmity with his friendship and reconciliation. How many of you today can, right where you are in all your anger, just say, I need him to be my friend, and I need his reconciliation. And I need him before me, even when I'm having a Monday. I need him to be bigger than scenario. I need a friendship that saves me from because he puts it in future tense. We shall be saved by his life. He's doing the saving. Praise God. Much more, much more, much more. You remember the woman at the well, John chapter 4? She had had a bunch of relationships that didn't work out. Jesus says, go fetch your husband. Let's talk to him. Because I'm talking to a woman, and I need to talk to a man. And she says, I don't have a husband. He said, you said right you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the one you're living with right now ain't your husband. I mean, even know it wasn't working out. But he said, you come here and draw from this well and you're still thirsty, meaning relationship. He said, but if you knew the gift of God and the one who talked to you right now, you would ask of him and he would give you water that would spring up out of your belly like rivers of living water and eternal life. They won't fail. You may be thankful for your friendship with Jesus. That's better than five husbands. Amen. How many Elizabeth Taylors do we have in this room? Say amen. <laughs> Third connecting point. Not only his lordship of love, lordship of friendship, much more friendship. Thirdly, he says in verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. This, this, the third connecting point is our freedom that Jesus brings through the free gift of everlasting life. Adam sinned, and it was the gift that kept giving. It just 
started this whole ripple effect with a bunch of little sinners popping up everywhere. And all the world wars and all the stuff that's happened through that one sin just multiplied. And the Bible says, but the free gift is not like that. This is the free gift that keeps on giving more freedom, more liberty. It says that when he sinned, he was condemned by God. His work was condemned. But when we receive the free gift, we are justified by God. How many of you are thankful that we're no longer under condemnation? The Bible says that God sent his son not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. The world, the Bible says, is condemned already. If you're not in Christ, you're living in a condemned world full of shame and guilt. And the Bible says death reigns over your life. What death? The death of what Adam did. Or narrow it down, the death of what maybe your parents did. How many of you have ever had to deal with a death? That wasn't like dying, but it was like somebody did something that just blew something wide open in your family. How many of you know Adam was good, but he wasn't good enough? How many of you have family members or parents that were good, but they weren't good enough? It's almost as if Adam was so good, but he did that one bad thing. Some of you wish you had terrible parents because it was that one bad thing that highlighted how much you lost. They put like a dark cloud over your family. Maybe it was your grandparents. I don't know where it came from. But Paul starts dealing with daddy issues in this passage. Not only what you did, but what came from your parents. Put death over you. And it was the gift that kept giving, rubbing your nose in it. The freedom that Jesus gives breaks generational curses, destroys everything in the past. It swallows up death. And it gives us life and freedom from death. And it's free. Everybody say free. free. It's to be received by faith. This gift, and what comes with the gift? Justification. The gift of righteousness, this is not a gift you can give back. No more than Adam could give back or take back his offense. It was a solemn judgment by God. You have fallen. I told you into that thing. You're going to get in trouble. That tree brought condemnation. This tree brings justification. Justification is the opposite of Condemnation. God didn't just friend you. He didn't just love you. He said, you are the righteousness of Christ. You're everything that Jesus did right rolled up into you. You may not feel it, but it's how God sees you. You may sin and mess up. God says, that's my boy. When, at, when John the Baptist said, are you the one or do we look for another? After he had said, oh, it's the Lamb of God. Jesus pulls out his billfold and says, John the Baptist is the best of all of you. When Abraham told uh, Abimelech, oh, that's my sister over there, when it was really his wife, God says, don't you touch Abraham. He's my prophet. God had his back even when he was a knucklehead. How many of you are thankful God really? Jesus said, whom the son sets free is free indeed. That's you're a child of God. You're his best. You want to talk about all the bad stuff you've ever done? But let me tell you something. Jesus don't want to talk about you when you get to talking with Jesus. All he wants to say is, do you have any idea every day I woke up and never sinned? You know how hard that was? I was tempted and all. People say, oh, that was just Jesus. He couldn't sin. He's a son of God. I agree. But I will say this. It takes a lot more not to sin, to endure every day, every kind of, how many of you know it's easy to sin? To sit there and resist it every single day. Adam got thrown away on one sin. Jesus 
every day of his life, woke up and thought about you and said, I ain't going to do it. Through his whole life, all the way to the cross, and we look to the cross as the sacrifice, but the cross is just the finish line of a whole life spent in pursuit of your soul to say this gift of righteousness is given to you on behalf of Christ. It's not just a gift of salvation. It's a gift of righteousness. As much as a judgment was over here, a judgment is over here. Isn't that wonderful today? I may be glad that God doesn't give you stuff just to say, I want it back. Why? Because it's a much more gift. Everybody say much more. It's a much more gift. Much more than what? Your slavery to sin. Can I continue just for a few more minutes? Somebody just yawned, and it's only 10. And he used to preach. Mark, I saw you yawn, Mark. You yawned. All right, let's keep going. I love Mark Kelly. He's awesome. He's just relaxing in the Lord, drinking it in. I know what he was doing. Very spiritual. Fourthly, verse 17, for by one man's offense, death reigned through one man much more. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through life, through him, and Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. For by one man's offense, death reigned. How many of you know that with death comes fear? Because you never know when death is coming after you. Your plans are not always right. I think that's why suicide's so high. Because people can control their own death. They're plagued by the fear of it. But it comes as a thief. You better have your will in place. You better have everything set up. You're in the middle of your plans and you just die. And there's a fear. How many of you have ever been scared of dying? Get on an airplane in turbulence and you'll feel it. Tornado come by your house, you'll feel it. There's a fear of it. But how many of you know that the Lord came to give us where death reigned over our lives? The Bible says we we're slaves to death until Jesus overcame death for us. We had nothing to look forward to. It was a meaningless existence because death will wipe out everything. Jesus came and he said, I give you peace where there's been a terror of death, fear of death. Death used to reign over your life. Now the peace of God reigns over your life much more. That's why at the beginning of this chapter it says we have peace with God. How many of you are thankful for the peace of God reigning over your life? Even when you're going through deaths, even when you're going through things in your life that you see with your eyes, there's something on the inside of you, that gentle tug of the anchor of your soul, even in the waves of life. The death that used to reign, reigns no more over our life. The sorrow of death, the loss of death, the fear of it. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? And thanks be unto God who always leads us into victory. He came to destroy death in our lives. That's why he's Lord. That's why we have peace because of the much more that is in our salvation through Christ Jesus. Thanks be unto God for our victory. He overcame death for us. That is why he is our Lord. Fifthly and finally, he says here, for as one man's disobedience, through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned, not only death reigned, sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The last much more, the last connecting point of our relationship with Christ 
of our salvation is God's super abounding grace. As we see sin all over the planet, and it's abounding everywhere, and every day we're touched by the selfishness of others. Every day we're dealing with people's selfishness. I'm going to be thankful for a life that's not defined by sin. We even have to deal with our own self. How many of you ever freaked yourself out by the, what you thought? You thought you were nice and you had no idea what you were capable of. It, it shocked you. You were like, man, I don't want to live with this guy for the rest of my life and I'm in his body. Does that even make sense? I know what I just said. I'm a preacher and I preach to myself every day. But what has God given us? This abounding grace, this much more grace for every sin we could ever commit. Every sin that's ever been committed and every sin that we could ever commit, the grace of God is much more. So I put this fifth point as his gracious purpose because sin is to miss the mark for your life. Sin is to not know why you're here. And all you're going to do is die. And there's no real purpose except for immediate gratification. You may die tomorrow. Get, don't procrastinate and getting what's yours now. That's sin. Sin is on the payroll of death. Sin says, yes, I have a loving X, Y, Z that I really don't want to hurt. But on the other hand, I may die tomorrow. Let's have at it. Why do old people sin? Because they're about to die. They say, you know what? I had some real self-control in my 30s and 40s, but now it's almost here, and, I better, and I'm going to live it up. My bucket list starts now with sin. How many of you know that you got to really sin when you, had, when you found no purpose in your life? When you got mis you didn't know what was happening, so you just got to sin in. That's the only thing to do. Oh, but Jesus wants to give you more joy than, and more comfort than the vices of your life can ever give you. Isn't it a terrible thing that the only thing that gives us great joy in this life apart from Jesus are vices? Vices that can destroy families. Vices that can destroy our lives, and yet they're the only things that really give us thrills. Oh, that God would give us much more in Christ. Not in religion, but in Jesus. So that we're not stuck with death and vices. But we have a gracious purpose. What is the purpose? Here it is, that grace might reign through righteousness. What does that mean? It means it's by his righteousness that grace reigns, but it's also living a righteous life. He's going to be so gracious to you, and his purpose is not going to change. This is what I really believe. And his purpose is not going to change by superbounding grace and favor on your life every time you're a knucklehead, Jacob. Every time you're swindling a blessing and lying and there, he catches up with you. Every time you're hiding out of fear, he shows up in your midst and says, peace, stick your hand in here. I'm going to be gracious to you and I'm going to stay on track and I'm going to bring you like a lamb back to the fold and I am not going to leave you like everybody else did, and I'm not going to forsake you like you almost did to yourself. And I'm going to bring righteousness about as much as Adam made sinners, Jesus makes saints. And he does a better job. And if you put your, if you know Adam made sinners and that's something every Christian knows, can you give Jesus some credit? 
of all the people that have made a difference in this whole wide world, I don't know anybody. I've looked on the pie chart. There are more Christians in the world than any other religion. Jesus has made a big impression on this world. Did you know that? He made a big splash. Why can't he do that in the life of the believer? The way he's done it on this world. Man, I'm here today because Jesus made a bigger impression on me than the devil ever did. I'm here today because of the five much mores over my life. His love, his friendship, his freedom. He purchased me out of bondage and set me free. His peace that he gives me when I'm trying to freak out, he's saying, don't fear. I know there's been a death. Don't trip out. I got this. Peace, I leave with you. And his grace that I can't, God bless you. I know somebody's going to get upset about this. I can't send my way out of. Because he put the justification on me. And that's why Paul in the next chapter says, shall we, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? I mean, he goes there because chapter 5 just went off the page with grace. Amen. He says, no, the death of the cross is working in you too. You've been unified with the one who died on the cross and he's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure and he's going to lead you on the right path. I'm not interested today in your scenario. I'm not interested today in your vice. I don't care. I want you to get over into what Jesus has declared about his life over you and he'll straighten everything else out in your life. How many of you thankful today that you have God's love for sin, for where it used to be sin and weakness? Friendship for just anger. Freedom from guilt and shame. Peace from a life dominated by fear. Grace and gracious purpose where it was just sin and vice as the chief joys of your life. We have a covenant-keeping God on our hands. And I want to read you one last thing as we're done today. About this Lord. How many of you thankful He's Lord of all? How many of you thankful that He was Lord to you, not because He said it, but because He demonstrated power over every enemy of yours. Listen to this as we close. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The Lord, my shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. How many of you today as a Christian say he's my champion? He's the champion of my faith. He has to win or it's not going to get done. People ask me sometimes, John, how are you doing? And they only ask it on Monday. I, those are fighting words. I don't want anybody to ask me how I'm doing. I walk on a tightrope and I don't want to look down. And I tell them, I tell them, Jesus Christ is going to make it when it comes to me. Because he will. Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. But I don't know 
if everybody in this room has received the reconciliation in Christ. See, listen, you can be religious, but if you really want a personal relationship with God, I don't know how you're going to keep up with God apart from Christ carrying the load. You're going to always fall short. You're going to weary yourself and at the end of the day give up if Jesus is not the one being the much more in a good way for your life. I don't want you to end up with sinners and end up with shame and guilt and death, and that's your lot in life. You say, John, what is faith? But before I get into what faith is, I want to say, why live in that world anymore? Why live where your best day is depending upon the weaknesses of your heart? Why live there where you're all alone at the end of the, the day and death defines you? Your parents and what they've done to you and Adam, all of that defines you. Why not come over to the winning team? Why not come over into Christ and let him, the battle belongs to the Lord, let him fight for you. And he will. He is a covenant-keeping God. And the Bible says when you trust in him, you are justified and have peace with God. It's that simple, but it wasn't that easy for him. This is about praising him, trusting in his life that it overshadows your entire life. And today, if you need his love, the love that he's able to give, if you need, and for me, faith is a need. Before it's mustering Full persuasion, it's like a little baby latching onto its mother's breast. It's, it's, it's that latching on out of the need of your life to be reconciled to God. And that's what Jesus came to do. That was his ambition coming to this earth for you and for me. Is there anybody here today that says, I don't want to walk out of here alone? I don't want to spend my life alone? I want to know that I know that Christ is my best friend. And he's not like anybody else. He's not like Adam and all those turkeys that came after him. He's not like that. He's much more. Let's all stand on our feet this morning. Let's just take a moment this morning and praise the Lord. If you are a real believer in Christ, that means that you have sincerely needed him to save you from your sin, to save you from your iniquities, to lead you and guide you all the days of your life like a shepherd. If that's you today, would you just lift up your hands to God and thank him? Just say thank you, Lord, today that you're my friend. Thank you for a love that just pursued me and subdued my life. Thank you for demonstrating it on the cross for me today. Thank you for my freedom in Christ. I just celebrate it today. Thank you for the peace of God that passes understanding that guards my heart. Thank you today, Lord God, for the gracious purpose you've called me to, even when things are up and down, that, Lord, you just keep pouring out more grace. You never run out. Could you imagine today Jesus running out of grace saying, man, he has ran his limit. He's taken all the grace I got. Now, just throw them away. He never runs out of grace. More, 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 more. Can we just say thank you to the Lord today on Easter Sunday? Thank you, Lord God, today for destroying death, destroying fear and sorrow, bearing it on your body, Lord Jesus. I have the peace of God today in my life. I praise you, Lord Jesus, for who you are today in my heart as I look outside of myself to you and trust in you alone for my justification. Is there anyone here today, you came on Easter, you could have gone someplace else, but somehow your feet landed here. And you say, I need to know that God is in control. 
He's not subject to scenario or events. He is bigger, has more resources, not subject to me. I need him to be the Lord of my life. I need him to subdue me with his love. I need him today to subdue me with his friendship. I need him to swallow up death and the fear of it in my heart. I need his peace. I need his freedom from shame and guilt and condemnation. And I need a grace that won't give up. I'm going to pray for you today. The Bible says if you will trust in him, if you'll put your hope in him, if you will out of your heart say, I identify my need for that in my heart today. The Bible says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You say, John, I need Jesus in my life. I don't want to walk out of here alone. I'm going to count to three. You just lift up your hand and say, that's me today. I say it before the Lord. It's very personal. It's very real and private in your heart. You say, I identify that need for God. I'm going to count to three. And you say, I want Jesus in my life. One, two, three. Just lift up your hand today and say, I need Jesus in my heart. I want Jesus in my heart. You know what he'll do? He'll take tragedies and turn them into miracles. That's what he did for me. He promises a happy ending to the whole deal. Anybody today just say, that's me. Just lift up your hand and say, that's me. I came here today to receive Jesus. Everybody put your hand on your heart this morning and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your friendship. I thank you for your love. I thank you for my freedom from guilt and shame and condemnation. Thank you that I'm justified. Thank you for your blood that covers all my sin. thank you for the peace I have because you overcame death I thank you for your grace that leads me on and I give you all the praise in Jesus name Amen we have people in the front today to pray with you some of the best in the world right here Andy Jacobs is one of the greatest men I know, pastored for many years, and he stands here with his beautiful wife, Sharon. My brother, Ryan Bibb, over on the left here, loves Jesus and wants to pray with you this morning. If you said yes to Jesus today, or maybe you've got some situation in your life that you're wrestling with, and you say, I just need somebody to agree with me in prayer, we're here to pray with you guys today. But we're going to end it this morning with a song, and then we'll say our closing, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing to Jesus this morning in response to the word.